Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Talking Cardboard. As always, my name is Corey, and today's episode is the first episode in my top 50 favorite board games of all time. I'm going through games 50 up to number 31 today, so let's get started. That's right, like I said, today's video are games number 50 up to 31 of my favorite board games of all time. And these are my favorite games as of January of 2024. So as true with anything in life, things can change on a daily basis, but at this moment in time, these are my 50 favorite board games of all time. So starting with number 50 on the list is The Voyages of Marco Polo. This is one of my favorite dice worker placement games of all time. In The Voyages of Marco Polo, everybody is given a really unique special character power to begin the game with as well. That is a game-breaking power, but what's really neat about that is all players are given a game-breaking special ability at the beginning of the game. But other than that, it's just a simple worker placement game where you're rolling out some dice, placing them on different worker placement spots. Depending on the value of the die, that'll get you different resources and different points to travel with around the map. You're trying to explore these different regions and trying to gather resources and trying to stake claim in these different regions around the map that'll open up different worker placement spots that are just unique to whoever has staked their claim there at that time and it's just really cool a lot of a lot of variability going on a lot of replayability you've got some in-game goals going on as well that keeps every game unique and fresh and just one of my go-to dice worker placement games so that is the voyages of marco polo all right, and number 49 on the list is one of my all-time favorite abstract games of all time. And the presentation of this game and the components of this game are just completely fantastic. Big, chunky tiles that you're playing with, and it's just a whole lot of game and strategy here with this one as well. And this is Azul. So Azul has a few different iterations of the game now, but I just keep coming back to the original Azul over and over again anytime I have that itch to play an abstract strategy game. And on your turn, you simply take all of one color from any of those circular hubs on the, on the table and take them into your possession, place them on your own player board, and the remaining tiles that you did not choose off of that hub go into the center of the table. And it's just that that option then expands into, on a future turn, you can take all of one color of tiles out of the center of the board or any one of the hubs. There's these like circular disc looking coasters that are around the table that have four tiles each on them. So you can take all of one color off of any of those circular discs or out of the center of the board. And you're trying to fill out your player board the best you can. And it's very thinky, very strategic, very difficult to fill out the different rows on your board as well. So I just love the strategy and trying to outwit your opponents and you and all of your opponents opponents are going after the same tiles on the table. So you're really trying to weigh your options on, do I take these tiles now or risk one of my opponents taking them before I can get to them to try to fill out your board the best you can. Depending on how you're filling out the different areas on your own personal player board, you will score points and combo points for doing so. So a nice, light, simple game, but provides a lot of strategy and one that you can just pull out, put on the table and play within 20 to 30 minutes and have a lot of fun with. So that is Azul. And my number 48 favorite game of all time is one of my favorite peer deck building games. And this game is Star Realms. Star Realms, <laughs> my wife loves the game, my friends love the game. I have passed a lot of time with previous coworkers at past jobs during our downtime and during our 15 minute breaks, just pulling out a game of Star Realms, quickly getting it played and going back to work. It's just one of those games, again, that you can sit down and play within you know, 10, 15 minutes if you and your opponent both know what they're doing. It can be played very quickly and is a lot of fun. It is a one-to-one -one head, head combat game, head-to-head, -head, where you are trying to take down your opponent from 50 life down to zero. And the way you're doing that, like I said, is with deck building. You're trying to buy cards to place into your discard pile, so then they later get shuffled into your main deck and you get to draw those new cards that you had bought to help better you know, attack your opponent. It's really neat the way the factions work in this game. There are four different color factions that really combo well with each other. And if you play two cards of the same faction down on the table, those can trigger special abilities within those cards. And you can really come at your opponent and hit them really hard for uh, you know, a 
big chunk of life points all in one play. So it's really fun to kind of combo that. And also in this game, there are cards that are in the landscape orientation that you can buy that are bases. And that's what I really appreciate about Star Realms is that unlike in a lot of other games, there isn't really a great way to really defend yourself as well as in Star Realms. So I really like the do I combo and try to hit my opponent real hard decision making between that or do I buy a couple bases, put them out onto the board, and now my opponent has to try to fight their way through my base before they can attack my life points directly. So really love the heck out of this game. It is getting a little bit older in age now, but I keep coming back to it over and over again. So that is Star Realms. All right, and my number 47 game is another abstract strategy game and another 1v1 style game, and is just a ton of fun. This game is Santorini. Like I said, one of my favorite all-time strategy abstract games of all time. In this game, each player is given a special god power. So kind of like in Voyages of Marco Polo, each player is given like a god power or a persona that has a special ability that is just completely game-breaking. In Santorini, it works a little bit differently though because some of the special god powers actually give you a different win condition than your opponent. So depending on what certain persona you've got, you might be trying to do something completely different than your opponent. But at the gist of this game, in its simplest form, you are essentially taking turns moving your two player components around the map and then building structures in Santorini. And the whole goal of the game, the whole goal of the basic game at least, is to build structures up to level three, to then hop your pieces up to that third level of the building to win. There's another strategy component in the game too where your, your opponent can run by your building and add a fourth level to the top of it, which is a rounded cap rooftop to the building. And that actually caps off the building and is unable to be used for the rest of the game. So you and or your opponent can't jump to the third level any longer because it's got a rounded rooftop on it. So no way to stand on top of that any longer. So it's really cool how you can play defensively in this game or you can play offensively and how each god power plays out so differently with your special ability and altering your win conditions. Like for example, you know, in the typical base game, you are trying to get to the third level of a building to win. You're trying to hop up three different stair levels to, to the top of the building for the win. But some god powers, for example, might be get up to the second level of a building and jump all the way down to the ground level for the win. And that'll give you the victory right then, then and there on the spot. So it's really cool how all these different God powers work and each one is just so completely unique. And that's why number 47 for me is Santorini. All right, number 46 is actually a game I no longer own in my personal collection. But I, I do wish I still had it and I am thinking about getting the second edition of this game because I do miss having it in my collection, but this game is Kemet. Kemet, it's another older kind of war style game where you're recruiting monsters and different units to your own personal army and you're trying to send them out to control different regions for victory points and whoever has the most victory points for controlling those different regions by the end of the game wins the game but what i really like about kemet and it's unique from really any other game out there even given its age kemet is an older game it's unique because you've got these different technology trees of factions that are in different colors. And with one of the expansions, it even adds a fourth color to those different tech trees. And each tech tree is good at doing something a little bit different. So like the blue faction, if you're buying units or monsters or troops out of the blue faction, generally they're better at defensive value. The red faction is better at offensive. And you've got some, you've got a black faction and a white faction, and they're good at either religion or messing with your opponents in different ways. And really it's neat to race after different monsters and troops and try to recruit them to your side of the forces and your, your army before your opponents can, because all the different factions and tech trees and monsters are available to you and all your opponents. So whoever gets there first, recruits them, gets them for the rest of the game. So it's fun kind of racing for those different monsters and troops to try to, try to to maneuver and outwit your opponents with that. And then sending them all out onto the battlefield is really rewarding as well to see what they can do for you to try to control those different territories. So that game is Kemet. 
All right, to my number 45 game of all time is a game that I haven't played now for about a year, year and a half. It's a difficult one to get to the table. It is a crunchy, kind of clunky mechanically, or mechanically speaking, a little bit on the clunky side for Euro games, but this is definitely a game that I'm going to keep in my collection for a long, long time, and one that I hope that we get tabled here soon again, and this game is Ginkopolis. Ginkopolis, like I said, it's a heavier Euro, heavier strategy Euro that has some clunky phases and clunky mechanisms to it, which is, I think, more of the reason why it doesn't see table play as often as I would like it to. But it is a really fun game when you and your group of players get uh, get familiarized with the game. In Ginkopolis, there's card play with tile placement and tile movement, and it's got a 3D element to the game as well, where you're not only building out tiles, but you're also building tiles upward. Whoever has the most of their own player pieces on a territory controls that territory and gets the value of points that is, that's associated with that territory. And like I said, there are some tiles that are worth more points than other tiles, and more tiles that are worth more if they're built up higher or built out uh, farther on the map, and the map is a common area as well. So you are placing tiles on a common common tile board along with your opponents and everybody is using that common area and that common map of tiles to try to area control and add on to and build upward from all in one synergistic way to try to outwit and beat uh, you know, beat their opponents. So it's a lot of fun with that. Like I said, the card play is really unique, drafting cards to your hand to give you specific actions and then using those cards to draft tiles place the tiles out in unique ways, and then mixes in some of that area control that I really like in my board games as well. So that is number 45, Ginkopolis. All right, and my number 44 favorite board game of all time has gotta be the newest board game to my list for this year. And it's, yeah, a brand new game that just came out recently, and it's a tile placement game that, uh, really jumped high up here on the list of my top 50 favorite board games of all time. And I think I've logged plays in boardgamegeek.com of about 800 different board games in my life so far. And so to, to really crack the top 50 out of those 800 games that quickly has gotta be saying something special about the game. And this game is World Wonders. And World Wonders, like I said, it is tile placement. It is a nice, nice, simple, easy, refreshing, uh, low barrier to entry tile placement game, but with it comes a ton of strategy. And I think by now you're probably sensing a common theme with today's list where it is more of I, not true for all of these, but a lot of these games are more of the simpler to learn and play, but hard to strategize and win. And I really appreciate that in a lot of my games. And a lot of the games like that, uh, that make my collection have those traits. So in World Wonders, like I said, it's tile placement, but you've got a common area of tiles that cost variable amounts of money. And you're trying to purchase those tiles and place them into your own personal player board area before other players can buy them up. And really difficult decision making because tiles of one color can only be placed adjacent to tiles of that same color. So you're balancing like, hey, do I take another red tile to place next to this other red tile? Or do I then have to, you know, if I don't have anything to really build off of, I might have to spend money on building out my road system more. Because you can either build tiles of one color adjacent to tiles of that same color, or you can build them adjacent to a road structure. So you might have to spend an entire turn buying and building a road that really might kind of set you back a half turn, but is required if you don't have any other way to place that tile. And another cool thing in World Wonders versus any other tile placement game out there is that you are also have a common area of cards that have these different World Wonder structures or different pictures of the World Wonder structures on them. And to purchase those, you have to spend all your remaining money for that round just on that World Wonder card. And when you do purchase that, when you decide to purchase one of those, those can have some mega points associated with them or uh, some really cool combos with that. And the structure itself, you get to build and take that nice chunky wooden piece and place it on your own personal player board so it does actually take up space on your board as well but with that every world wonder is unique every world wonder has different requirements for adjacency placement and where it must be placed on your on your player board so you have to keep that in mind with comboing that with the regular town tiles that you're placing on your map as well so some you know some world wonders like to be next to water other world wonders might like to be next to two red tiles or two purple 
purple tiles or next to a rock structure with a green tile. And they all have these different requirements that you're trying to build up toward and then try to snatch that world wonder structure before your opponents can take that from you as well. So it is so much so a tension game where the, the tension builds as you're racing toward trying to grab things before your opponents can get them. So that is World Wonders. All right, and my number 43 on the list is a party game that I champion to the hilt. Every single day of every single year, I am the one championing this for this game. And I really, really like it a lot, but I don't hear it being talked about a ton. And this game is When I Dream. When I Dream is a simple game where you've got a card with a picture on it and the word of what that picture is associated with in the center of the table. And you've got one person wearing a blindfold and the other players around the table are the clue givers. But what makes this game really unique is that some of the clue givers are on the good side and trying to get the blindfolded person to guess the clue correctly. And some of the players are on the bad side or in this game considered the boogeymen and they're trying to give bad clues uh, bad one word clues to the blindfolded person to get them to guess it incorrectly. Uh, if the good people, if the fairies are able to get the blindfolded person to guess the clue correctly, they get points for that and vice versa for the boogeyman. So it's a cool dynamic between that and just a nice, again, simple, light, fun, fast playing party game where it's just fun to try to give clues to throw off your, your the blindfolded person or you know if you're on the bad side or vice versa if you're on the good side. And it's just really cool to see that, that dynamic as it's passed around the table and to see how many cards the blindfolded person can guess correctly. It's just a lot of fun to see every time. You just play one round around the entire table where everybody gets a chance to wear the blindfold one time and whoever has the most points at the end of that wins. So like I said, it's another game that can probably be played within like 20, 30 minutes pretty quick if you all know what you're doing and but packs a, a nice, fun, entertaining punch within that 30 minutes as well. So that game is When I Dream. All right, my number 42 game on the list is probably the driest Euro game on my entire top 50 games of all time. It's extremely dry. But another one that my wife and I really enjoy playing, and I believe it's only been her and I that have ever played the game. I've only played this game at two player. Wish I could play it with more players, but even at two player, it's a lot of fun. But yeah, it's a tough sell. It's a very dry game. This game is Merv, the Heart of the Silk Road. In Merv, the Heart of the Silk Road, you've got a common area map in the middle of the table where you've got these different quadrants on the, on the map of these different town quadrants. And you've got a player piece that you are sending around the square board trying to land on a spot that either inter intersects with a column or a row in that grid system. Depending on where you land, you can build structures in a town that is within that column or row, or you can get, gather resources from that column or row. And once you go there, you are blocking that spot from your opponent for that entire round. So it's a really cool push and pull mechanism where you're blocking a spot from your opponent, but then you're also able to do something with that column or row to either, like I said, build a structure on it. So then you're blocking that town from any of the other players for the rest of the game, or you're gathering resources from it. And there's different ways to combo the buildings and the combo what you get from the different towns and just kind of looking at what your opponent is going to do and what you need to do and maybe trying to block them from some spots as well. So it's got a lot of push and pull to it. And really the main thing around the entire format of the game is that the resources and the different actions you're taking within these towns wherever you land is really just trying to get you up on different tracks to score you victory points in various ways. So if you like dry euros where you're trying to kind of mess with your opponents and block your opponent from different spots to get what you need to contribute to moving up on different tracks, like I said, it sounds extremely dry, but for me and my wife, it's a ton of fun. Uh, give it a try. Merv, Heart of the Silk Road might be for you. And another game that was kind of a flash in the pan. It was talked about for maybe a couple months and then went completely goodbye and haven't heard uh, many people talk about Merv any longer. So like I said, a lot of fun if you don't mind the dry Euros. So that is my number 42, Merv, Heart of the Silk Road. 
All right, and just missing my top 40 is my game number 41, and this is one of the very first games I ever purchased in the hobby. I believe this was maybe game number three that I ever bought way back in the day. It's been about 15 years now since I've been into hobby board gaming, and for this game being still number 41 and being one of the first few games I ever purchased into my collection, that is saying a lot about this game. And this game is Stone Age. Stone Age, another simpler year Euro that a lot of people kind of give grief to because it is almost too simple for a lot of, of the more hardcore gamers. But if you have a family or younger gamers in your life, or if you're newer to the, to the hobby, board gaming hobby, then Stone Age is a great place to start for your introduction to worker placement. So in Euro games, there are a lot of different mechanisms that you can purchase games for. And I think Stone Age does the worker placement mechanism very, very well. And what worker placement is, is you are sending workers out to different locations on the board, again, blocking your opponent from those locations to, to get a benefit from that location. In Stone Age itself, specifically, you are sending workers to various regions to try to gather resources. You're trying to build huts for victory points. You're trying to collect these bonus cards. And the bonus cards have these little requirements or these little missions on them that you're trying to fulfill for victory points. And it's a game that you have to be okay with scoring in the high 200s or into the, into the 300s worth of points because you are getting a ton of points in this game. But it's just a lot of fun. One of the things I like the most about Stone Age, and I know worker placement is kind of like, oh, it's just worker placement and not any other mechanisms thrown into the game. That's too simple. But what the designers did really uniquely in Stone Age with the worker placement is that depending on how many workers you're sending to a location, that'll tell you the amount of strength you have at trying to fulfill that action. So for example, if you send workers out to the woods to try to chop down trees and gather wood, the, the number of workers you send to that location is the amount of dice you get to roll, and then you divide that total number that you roll out of, the, out of the dice by a value. So for when you're gathering wood, you're dividing it by three. If you're gathering something more difficult like stone or you know brick or stone or gold, you're dividing by four, five, or six, so it gets more and more difficult to gather the more difficult the resource is to, to physically get then you get that many resources based on what you roll dividing that number out so it's really cool how that works it's very thematic and i really the thing i like most about this game is that you're really messing with your you kind of your push your luck and how many workers do I need to send to a location to make sure I get what I need or I push my luck and send just enough to maybe get what I need. So that is really fun to me and I think most of the people I've showed this game to have really appreciated it as well. So that is my number 41, Stone Age. All right, now breaking into my top 40 favorite board games of all time here, working our way up to 31 here today, getting really excited about this because this is my first cooperative game on the list. It might be one of my only cooperative games on the list. We'll have to check later videos for that to see if there are any other cooperative games that fall on my list someplace, but number 40 is Horrified. Horrified, another simple game, a game that you can find at big box stores like Target, for sure Target and, and Barnes and & Noble, maybe Walmart, but don't let that turn you off. Horrified now does have a few different thematic differences, that, a few different boxes you can buy based on what your thematic preference is, but I just keep coming back to the original Horrified, which is the Universal Monsters. So you've got like Dracula and the Wolfman, Frankenstein and his Bride, the Invisible Man. You've got all these different monsters that you're trying to cooperatively take down around the town. In Horrified, mechanically, it's a very simple structure, just kind of like in, like in Pandemic, for example. If you've played the game Pandemic before, you've got a set number of actions associated with your character that you can do on your turn. And the actions are anything from move, a, move to another location, to pick up some items at that location, try to uh, submit items or com submit items to a monster or combat them using your items, and you're using these action points to do these various things. So some people, some characters might only have three or four actions to use on, on your turn. And if you move two locations, now two out of those three actions have already been taken up. So it's a really uh, tight strategy puzzle where you and your teammates are really trying to uh, come together and try to best collect these different items at the different locations to try to crack the overall puzzle. 
All the monsters that you're combating are completely unique, completely asymmetrical. Their win conditions and how to defeat them are completely unique as well. So every game is different. And what I really appreciate about Horrified is that you can tailor the difficulty of it depending on your playability or how good you have become at the game. So if you're just trying to combat two monsters, that's a lot easier than trying to take down three or four monsters. And you can decide that ahead of time before the game begins. So I really like that about Horrified, how simple it is, but also the cooperative nature of it and how asymmetrical all the monsters are. It makes each game feel completely unique. So that is my number 40, Horrified. All right, to my number 39 is another tile placement game on the list, and this one, I guess, beat out World Wonders, or is so far this year higher than World Wonders at this moment in time, and this game is Queen Domino. Queen Domino, you might see that game higher on John's list from Talking Cardboard after he does his video. Uh, of, his, of his top favorite games of all time because he just loves the heck out of this game. But in all honesty, everybody I've shown this game to has just loved the heck out of it. It's a simple tile placement game, but what I really like about this one is the drafting mechanism at the beginning of each round or the beginning of each turn. You've only got one worker that you can send out to a tile to claim a tile, and once that tile is claimed, it becomes yours and nobody else can have it. It's really neat the way that works too because at the beginning of every round or beginning of every phase, the tiles are laid out from top to bottom with if they're less valuable to more valuable. And that really matters a lot too because if you're taking a tile that is more valuable or objectively more valuable, then you are going later in turn order to claim the next tile in the next round. So that is the most fun with this game, is really deciding on when to take the best tiles or when to take a little bit less of a valuable tile to then try to, to make sure you get a better tile in the next phase. And you're, you're combining tiles with like colors. So similar colors are touching one another adjacently and some of the tiles have queen's crowns on them and some of the tiles don't, but really the way the scoring works at the, at the end of this game is very simple. You are taking the different regions and territories of different colors you're adding up how many squares, how many domino squares are in each of those regions co connected and combined, and you take the amount of queen's crowns that is in that area as well and multiply the queen's crowns by the area value. So if you've got an area of like five blue tiles with two crowns in it, two times five is 10 points at the end of the game. And you're just building this little tiny simple five by five grid in front of you, but it's just the puzzle is very cool. The drafting of the tiles is very cool. And uh, like I said, one that usually goes over pretty well with most of the players I have, I have taught this game to. So that is number 39, Queen Domino. All right, and my number 38 game is another brand new game to the list and is a game that is brand new to the public as well. Just came out, it's a hot racing game from Days of Wonder and it's Heat Pedal to the Metal. Yes, I know, everybody's talking about Heat, but it just, it. It just hopped right up to my number 38 on the list the very first year it came out, but for good reason. It is, if not my favorite racing game, definitely one of my favorite racing games of all time. I love deck building as a mechanic, and Heat Pedal to the Metal has some element of deck building injected into the whole mechanical formula of the game, so I really like that a lot. In Heat, you are simply racing around a track, but you're using and playing cards to, to play down for your speed. The different corners around the map have different values to them, and you have to you have to maintain your speed either at or below that that corner value. Because if you if you exceed that value, you are essentially going too fast around the corner, and you spin out, and uh, you have to go back to your starting spot around the corner and and retry it in your next turn. So it really slows you down a lot. And another cool mechanism in this game too is the center pile of cards on your personal player board. They're called heat cards, and they're in your engine and you can manipulate that heat depending on what you're doing. So for example, if you want to try to turbo boost, you can add that heat from the, from the engine to your discard pile to then play another speed card to turbo boost, but now you're adding that heat like I said, to your discard pile, that'll get shuffled into your draw pile and later be drawn as a pointless card that does nothing for you. It really clogs up your deck. 
So that is another thing too, if you take a corner too fast, the amount of value you went over the value of that corner, you have to take that many heat cards from your engine and place them in your discard pile. So that slows down your deck as well, but it's really fun to manipulate that heat and either add heat back to your engine or take heat out to turbo boost and to do different things. There's some drafting behind people in this game as well. So it's got a, a lot of fun tactical decision-making. So that is my number 38, Heat Pedal to the Metal. All right, and my number 37 game is another game I don't own, but one that just is first debuting on the list here at number 37, but for reasons you might not expect. This game is not a newer game. I actually played the, the second edition of this game with my brother, because my brother owns this game, but I have never owned the game and I never played the first edition back in the day, but him and I have played it a couple times recently and it just really, uh, really gelled well with my uh, the games that I tend to enjoy. And this game is is Summoner Wars 2nd Edition. Summoner Wars, another one-to-one, -one, head to head combat style game, but it's really fun. It, it, it's really fun in the way it, it changes things. Think almost kind of like Magic the Gathering or summoning creatures or cards down to the play field, but you're summoning, the, summoning them onto a grid map that you can then tactically move around and uh, roll dice to like shoot arrows and shoot different magic spells at your opponents and try to take them down. And it's just really fun how it's integrating a, a combat monster summoning magic style card game with a spatial element to it as well. M moving the cards around the map and trying to get within range or just out of range from your opponent's monsters and their summoner has a very strong ability. So you're either trying to get out of range of that summoner or trying to get close enough to summon things, you know, and kind of block their line of sight and just kind of mess with the whole board tactically as well. So that is my number 37, Summoner Wars. All right, to my number 36 on the list is another oldie but goodie. It is a Euro game that has stayed strong in my collection for many years, and I think has been on my top 50 favorite board games of all time list since I started doing this list about five years ago, and that is Coal Baron. Coal Baron is a game I just introduced to the other Talking Cardboard members recently, and they just loved the heck out of it, had never heard of it, had never played it, and one that I kind of dusted, you know, dusted it off a little bit, brought it off the shelf, and kind of wanted to reintroduce this game to some players again because I just love teaching this game and introducing it to new players. A simple one at heart, again, another simple kind of worker placement style game, but one that has another unique twist to it. So with my Euro games, I do like the different mechanisms that are involved, but if there's going to be a game that has a mechanism that is similar in a few, a few other games that I have in my collection, then it's gotta be done a little bit differently for it to have that mainstay or that staying power. And Coal Baron is no exception to that. In Coal Baron, everybody starts the round with 20 workers that they can send out to the main board to try to do different actions. The different actions are collecting different coal cars to put down into their mine, or there's different actions on to activate your elevator, either sending it down or sending it back up to the top. You're trying to collect different colors of coal while you're down in the mines to bring it back up to the surface to fulfill contracts but you can't only just fulfill the contracts based on the requirements or based on what the customer wants, but you also have to send it to them by their requested mode of transportation. Send it to them by train or horse and carriage or, or by vehicle and th that sort of thing. So the vehicle's type matters, uh, the type of coal that you're sending to fulfill that contract matters. And you've got these different goals from round to round where you're trying to send or complete the most contracts via train or the most contracts that requires yellow coal or black coal or these different different goals that you're going after from round to round and whoever can do that the best and score the most points doing that will win the game at the end. It's just, it sounds very simplistic at heart, but one that goes over very well every time I have introduced this game to others. And one that I think will stay, stay strong for many, many years to come in my top 50 games of all time. So that is number 36, Coal Baron. All right, and my number 35 game on the list is another game that hasn't hit the table in quite a while, and I wish it would here soon. So I think I'm going to, to push for this game to hit the table uh, between now and the next few weeks here because I have been itching to play it again for some time. This game is In the Hall of the Mountain King. This is a game where you're trying to dig through the mountain and try to open up different caverns or different rooms within the cave. You're trying to erect different monuments or different uh, stone structures in the cave for victory points and doing that all by this really cool cascading uh, card mechanism where you are playing cards in front of you 
that trigger and give you resources based on the pyramid of cascade that I, I like to call it so the way that works is that when you place a card into the row on the pyramid the bottom row can take up to four cards and then it goes three two and one but as you are placing a card you immediately get to gather that action or the resources off of that card and anything that it is touching below it so as you're building up your your pyramid of resources and you get to the, the second level or the third or fourth level in that pyramid, when you place that card, you get to trigger that card's ability and anything underneath it that that card is touching. So I think that mechanism is really cool and one that you don't see in very many games at all. I can't even think of any other game off the top of my head that really uses that mechanism, but in, in the Hall of the Mountain King, it uses it very effectively and very uniquely and it's very cool. And again, it's another game where it's not too complex to teach or to play. Like I said, I pretty much just taught it all, all within a couple minutes here where you're just placing a card and gathering what it says off of it and trying to dig throughout the mountain to basically build these different monuments and effectively get the most points doing so. But the way that it is done mechanically and the way that the game is structured around that main core mechanism of the cascading pyramid of, of resource actions it is done really, really uniquely. So, like I said, a game that I haven't played for a while, and I think it's a game that's kind of a tough sell just by trying to explain it, but one that I hit, I hope hits the table more often here soon, and that is my number 35, In the Hall of the Mountain King. All right, my number 34 game is one of my all-time favorite two-player only games, and I'm just gonna say it here, it is Raptor. Raptor is, like I said, one of my favorite two-player games of all time, where one player takes on the role of the scientists trying to capture the Velociraptors, and the other player takes on the role of the raptors. So you've got a mama raptor and baby raptors that you're moving around the board. All in the wild, your other, the other player is playing the scientists, and you're trying to move them around the board to capture the raptors. And it, the way the way that that's done is just, the, the theme is very clever, it's very well integrated. But the main mechanism that drives this whole game is the card play. I really, really, really love the card play in this game. And to be real honest, I've, I've played this game with multiple people and some of the people I've played with, with, it's gone over very well and others it's gone over very poorly. And I don't know why I, you know, maybe that this, this card mechanism speaks to me more so than most people, but each player has a hand of cards, values one through nine, and the cards are good for two different things. It's good for the inherent value of the card, so either the one through the nine, or it's good for the special ability that is listed and printed on that card itself. And the way that that works is that secretively, you and your opponent are choosing a card from your hand, playing it face down on the table, and simultaneously revealing that card. And whoever played the higher value card gets to do general actions with those action points. Whoever played the lower value card gets to do that special ability that's printed on the card itself. So I really love the push and pull and the push your luck with that mechanism and trying to outguess what you think your opponent is gonna play to try to play the card that will be the most effective for you. And the cards that have been played in previous rounds are left face up. So it, it narrows down the options on what your opponent can play. So it kind of really helps with that as well. And there's a card that you can play to recall all the cards back to your hand as well. But until you play that card, everything is just common knowledge of the previous cards you've played. So for example, if I play a value eight card against a value three, I take the difference between the two in the amount of action points. So my eight card minus the three is five action points I get to play with. And action points can be anything from attacking the other player to moving around the map and just the general generic actions that I can do that with. But the player who played the value three card, which is the lower card, they don't get any general action points to use at all, but they get to trigger the effect that is printed on that card. And every one of the effects is completely unique and asymmetric and can be very powerful in their own right. So really fun, push and pull, push your luck, trying to outguess your opponent and trying to go after your asymmetric win condition, depending on if you're playing the scientists or the Velociraptors. So that is my number 34, Raptor. All right, to my number 33 game is one of my favorite Stefan Feld games of all time. And I say one of my favorite because you might see a couple others higher up on the list, but, uh, this game is Amerigo. 
Amerigo is one of Stefan Feld games that people don't really, I don't think it really resonates with a lot of different players, but for me, it is one of Stefan Feld's best games of all time. Really, really enjoy Amerigo. In Amerigo, it's got a couple really cool mechanisms going on. And like I said earlier in this video, I'm a very heavy mechanisms driven person, but this has got a cube tower and it's also got some tile placement as well. And I love both of those mechanisms a lot. So in this game, you are taking a handful of different colored cubes and putting them into a tower and whatever cubes fall out and don't get stuck in the tower along the way, but whatever cubes fall out the bottom will tell you what actions you can do, which is the different colored cubes those will tell you you know what color what color action you can do based on the color of cubes but also the the most of one color of cube that pops out the bottom is the amount of actions you can do with that action so for example if five red cubes two blue cubes and one yellow cube popped out the bottom well, you can either do a red, blue, or yellow action, but because red had five that popped out, which was the, the highest value of any one color cube, you can do five action points of any one of those three color actions. So it's really cool. It's kind of difficult to explain and kind of difficult to wrap your head around when you're first playing this game. But once you get the hang of it after one or two rounds, it's, it's very, very enjoyable. You are trying to collect uh, tiles to place in front of you and then you send those tiles out to these different islands. You are navigating the map on a, on a boat around the map and you're trying to place houses on these different islands and, and uh, place these tiles that come off of your houses. And depending on if, you are, uh, if you're able to place a tile over a resource, you can collect that resource for yourself and do, uh, try to get points with those resources. You're also trying to get points by filling out, a, you know, completely filling out an island or if you control the majority of an island you get more points than that than your opponent so it's got a little bit of area control with that tile placement and also that action selection cube tower is just a ton of fun so i think it's one of stefan feld's most underrated games if i had an opinion on that but for me it's my number 33 favorite game of all time and that's amerigo all right, and two more games to go here on today's list. And number 32 is another game that I've had in my collection for many, 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 many years. And kind of a fun fact with it too is when the first edition of this game came out, I rated it like a four out of 10. I just completely could not stand the game. And then actually when the Essential Edition came out a few years after the fact, now it's turned into at least a nine, nine and a half out of 10 for me, and I've loved it ever since. The new second edition or essential edition it changed a couple of the rules around and uh, changed a couple of the mechanisms around a little bit, and it made all the difference. So this game is Viticulture Essential Edition. In Viticulture, you are the owner of a vineyard and you're trying to run your vineyard better than any of your other opponents. And to do that, you are using the worker placement mechanism again, but it's done in a fun way in this game. With the Tuscany expansion, which I play with every single time now, it has four seasons to the game. If you don't have the Tuscany expansion, the base game just has two seasons, either a summer or winter, which is still a lot of fun. But if you do end up getting the Tuscany expansion, if you like the base game enough, it introduces spring, summer, fall, and winter, so four different seasons. And why that matters is that depending on what season you're in, different worker placement spots are open for your workers to go to. So if it's springtime, you only have the spring worker placement spots available for you to go to, and you must pass for the season and wait for all the other players to pass their spring season as well before you can then move on to the summer season and so on and so forth. The different actions consist of planting seeds for, for grape vines, gathering grapes, putting them into your crush pads, crushing the gra grapes and making them into wines, making them into different kinds of wines like sparkling wine, or blush or any of those other different various types of wines and you're doing that to try to get wine into your cellar that your customers will want. The customers will visit your winery and do tours and different things like that and demand different kinds of wine, whatever type of wine they like and you're fulfilling their contracts with the type of wine that you're making. So again, like with a lot of other worker placement games, especially worker placement games that came out 10 years ago or so, it is worker placement with contract fulfillment is, is, the, is the gist of the game. But also there are cards that you can play to really change the different actions in, in this game. The actions are unique to you. And it's not just simple contract fulfillment. You're also trying to essentially run a vineyard. And it really does kind of feel like you are running your own vineyard. You're you know planting the vines and collecting the grapes and trying to make these 
different wines to fulfill these contracts. And that whole process is just a really fun exercise to do. So I really like Viticulture a ton. It used to be higher up on my list years ago, but still holding strong at my number 32. So that is a Viticulture and uh, specifically the Essential Edition. All right, and real quickly, before we get into my number 31 favorite board game of all time, I just wanted to say, if you like what we're doing here on the channel, please consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below, and let us know what some of your favorite board games are of all time so we can comment back and forth and either agree or disagree on those, because it is all in good fun. But like I said, if you enjoy what we're doing, consider subscribing. Just the click of a button really goes a long way and helps us out a lot. So let's get back to my number 31. All right, and the last game on the list here today is my number 31. One of my favorite Alexander Pfister games of all time, but spoilers, you might see a couple other Alexander Pfister games higher up on this list. But uh, number 31, still holding strong, still very high up there. And another game that I think is very underrated for this caliber of designer, and this is Blackout Hong Kong. Blackout Hong Kong is a lot of fun. It's got a lot of area control in it, just like a lot of the other Euro games I like. I like mixing that area control strategy that you typically see in American style games, but I like mixing it with the Euro mechanisms, and Blackout Hong Kong does this very well. Because essentially, the core mechanism that drives this game is card play, but it's card play in different columns in front of you. And depending on which column in front of you you decide to play a card to really matters. At the start of the game, you have three available columns that are available to you, and you can unlock a fourth column later on in the game uh, as you meet a certain requirement. But essentially, in those three columns of cards, as you play that card, you're doing an action with that card. So you're like placing cubes on the main player board. You're trying to, like I said, area control and trying to uh, control these different regions to try to get the most points for, for that, but also doing different Different actions with it and gathering resources and uh, manipulating your different actions with those cards but meanwhile at the end of the round you have to recall all the cards from the column that has the most cards and that's a very important thing because there are some cards that actually gain you a benefit by remaining out on the table and out on your player board and if you're recalling them off the player board it will no longer have any effect for those actions that you're trying to combo those cards with because a specific action or requirements require you to have a certain level or a certain number of different color cards in different columns at different points throughout the game. So you're trying to balance what you're playing when and which column you're playing it to and being very careful at choosing that opportune moment to recall cards out of a column and hopefully not doing so prematurely. So a lot of fun. I love the card play in Blackout Hong Kong. Like I said, I love area control, uh, the, the resource management and gathering the resources and uh, essentially, the, the theme is you are running around the map trying to help everyone out and give food to people and trying to get the power back online. And like, like the game suggests, it's a blackout in Hong Kong. So all the power is out, everyone's off the grid, and there's a lot of dangers along the way. Essentially, the cards you're playing have different people on them, and they can get hurt when they're going out to do different duties and they have to be sent to the hospital. And there's actually a way, there's a doctor card to get them out of the hospital and back into your hand and that sort of thing too. So that's a lot of fun playing with that. So the theme plays into it a little bit, but really the core card play mechanisms with that area control is what I enjoy the most about Blackout Hong Kong. So that is my number 31. All right, so that does it for today's list. My top 50 up to 31 favorite board games of all time as of January, 2024. I hope you all enjoyed the list. I hope you all are having fun watching these videos and stay tuned for future videos when we get into the 30 through 21, then eventually the top 20 games of all time where I bring in other members of Talking Cardboard to give their take on what their top 20 favorite games are of all time. Some of them might be willing to give their full top 20. Some of the members might just be doing their top 10, but either way, we're gonna bring a bunch of other videos here shortly in the near future. So you can all watch those videos to get a glimpse of what their favorite games are of all time. So until next time, you all have fun gaming and enjoy your day.